Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another week of uh, studying from God's Word, learning, um, and welcome to our class on um, Titus. We finished First and Second Timothy, and we began uh, looking and studying the book of Titus um, last week. And a very good morning to all of you. For some of you, it's night. I'm not going to say good night unless you'll fall asleep. <laughs> Must be uh, tired, but uh, thank you all for uh, uh, joining class. And I just uh, pray that it just be a meaningful time for all of us. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Can I ask Siddhant to lead us in prayer, please? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this time, for your grace and mercy, Lord. Thank you for the classes, Lord. As we learn, Lord, help us to receive and understand. Lord, we surrender ourselves to the word of your grace, which is open to build us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Siddhant. Um, last uh, Monday, we began studying the book of Titus. We looked at the first nine verses. And... Um, uh, we, we, we just saw in verses 6 to 9, uh, you know, uh, what Paul writes to Titus, how he must look for, uh, you know, uh, leaders, appoint uh, leaders, and then he lists out various qualifications uh, that uh, he needs to look at uh, as he appoints leaders at the church for the churches at uh, the island of Crete. And so we uh, divided these qualifications into four categories, uh, domestic, personal, positive, and doctrinal qualifications. And we looked at um, all of the qualifications that Paul, Apostle Paul lists out for Titus in these uh, four different categories, which he mentions in verses uh, 6 to uh, nine, and then he, uh, you know, goes on to talk about the characteristics of false teachers. Now, why does he bring in the characteristic of, of, of false teachers when he's talking to him about uh, uh, the qualities or uh, you know the the important things that he must look at while appointing leaders? Is he's saying that you know it's so important for um, Titus to appoint uh, leaders at the churches of Crete because of um, the background uh, that these uh, people had. You know, the Cretans were known as um, uh, uh, greedy, lazy gluttons um, and, uh, you know, evil as well. They were very evil. So one of their own uh, poets who they looked at as a prophet said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts and lazy gluttons. And in the midst of such a kind of... Um, you know, uh, characteristics of people that dwelt in um, the island of Crete, uh, Paul is mentioning how important it is for Titus to appoint the right kind of leaders. And then he goes on to say that, you know, the, the need to appoint such kind of leaders is because uh, that there are so many false teachers uh, uh, in the island of Crete among the people, uh, among the believers uh, in the churches as well. So this is not a problem from outside, but within. And then he talks about the characteristics of these false teachers. And then he goes on to tell him what he needs to uh, do. So one of you can please read uh, verses 10 to 16, please. And before you read that, uh, you know, the notes are very elaborate and detailed. And as I mentioned last week, this is my own study and research. So whatever, you know, I have um, studied, I've just put in the entire content. So it's quite, uh, uh, you know, lengthy, uh, 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 complete content that is there. And I'm just going to teach from this because there's nothing more that I need to add. And um, I'm not just going to be touching on every uh, aspect. I'm going to be just mentioning, highlighting a few points because it's very detailed and um, I've given it in detail so that you all can use it for your own personal uh, study. Okay, so with that, we'll begin looking at verses 10 to 16. Can one of you please read verses 10 to 16, please, of Titus chapter 1? Yes, for there are many rebellious people full of mean, meaningless talk and deception especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach. 
and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unf unfit for doing anything good. Amen. Thank you, uh, Christopher. So in uh, we see in these verses, uh, Paul is listing out the kind of false teachers, or the characteristics of false teachers that are there in the island of Crete. And he says there are many of them. So, you know, there are many who stand opposed to the truth. He mentions this in verse 9, as well as in verse uh, uh, 14, uh, that there are many who, and also in verse 10, there are many who are insubordinate. So there are many who stand opposed to the truth of the gospel. Uh, and uh, he says that there are insubordinate, which means that they are not willing to subordinate or will, willing to submit themselves to uh, God's authority or God's authority structure that he has placed in the church. And these um, false teachers or these, um, you know, those who are teaching false doctrines, they are basically people who are, uh, you know, uh, uh, indulging or uh, who are just speaking empty talk. Uh, there's no point in what they're saying. There's nothing, there is, there's no truth. Uh, there's nothing substantial in what they're saying. They basically, their empty talk is all about Jewish fables, uh, which is like fictitious tales, which they talk about, you know, Adam, Moses, and Elijah, and all the other, uh, you know, saints in the Old Testament. I already mentioned this when we were studying uh, the book of uh, First and Second Timothy, and also Romans as well. Uh, so all of these false teachers that, you know, all of these uh, in these various churches at Ephesus, at Rome, at Crete, uh, were not false teachers who were outside the church, who were impacting the saints or the believers in the church but they were these uh, Jewish uh, uh, you know Hellenistic Jews those who were um, you know came from the Jewish faith and they they received salvation they're part of the church but they're bringing in all of these uh, Jewish uh, fables mythology about uh, you know the prophets and the Old Testament saints and also uh, what he says is these uh, false teachers can be characterized by people who are having you know, making their own commandments, commandments of men, which is, you know, uh, they're very legalistic, ascetic in, um, in their uh, rules, very severe in their kind of rules uh, that they are uh, bringing in, uh, which is basically these rules and regulations of they're being very legalistic in uh, dealing with the things of the flesh. So it's basically circumcision, the kind of food that they need to eat, uh, bringing in all of these Jewish um, laws uh, regarding the way you need to pray, the way you need to dress, the way you need to eat, and also uh, the circumcision uh, ritual. So he says that, you know, uh, these men who teach these false teaching are basically empty talkers because they talk about Jewish fables and, uh, you know, they have their why it's called commandments of men, which is very uh, legalistic and ascetic uh, uh, or very severe in their rules. It's basically they're doing it to deal with the things of the uh, flesh. Okay, And that is why uh, Paul is saying it's so important or it's absolutely necessary uh, for him to choose uh, elders who hold on to the truth in the gospel and, uh, you know, uh, and they're able to preach and teach the truth uh, so that it can impact the lives of uh, people who are influenced by these false uh, uh, teachers. And he says, you know, uh, that uh, they're idle talkers and deceivers is be because basically they're being deceived by Satan 
and uh, and it's only the truth in God's word uh, that has the power to change life. So he's saying, you know, we just preach and teach uh, the word of God. And he says that these false teachers are es especially those of the circumcision. Um, the, you know, other version says that they are uh, some of them who are from the Jewish followers. The pra Passion Translation says converts from Judaism. So this gives us a clue or the identity of the nature of these false teachers uh, who were, you know, bringing about false teaching in the uh, churches at Crete. Uh, these were Jewish Christians uh, or Jews who became Christians, who became believers and uh, who insisted on, you know, circumcision and keeping the ritual of the law in terms of food, in terms of how they pray, and other things uh, which was necessary for uh, salvation. And in verse 11, um, uh, Apostle Paul says that, you know, they must be stopped, uh, whose mouths must be stopped. That means these offenders must be refused or not given the opportunity to spread their teachings in the churches. And also uh, this, this word stopped uh, means uh, it also uh, that you need to silence them uh, by, you know, logically denying uh, their views uh, from the truths in uh, God's word uh, so that, you know, you can stop them from further uh, causing damage or bringing division in the church and spreading uh, their false uh, teaching, which would, you know, impact the entire church uh, families, uh, and there can be such a chaos in the uh, church. And he says, you know, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert how whole households. So uh, subvert means the word birth, B-E-R-T, in this, in this word subvert means turn. So basically the word subvert means uh, to overturn or to overthrow. So, you know, these uh, false teachers and their false teaching is basically having such a disastrous effects in the life of the church that it's overturning or overthrowing families or the entire house churches that are gathering, that are meeting together to uh, worship God. So he's saying, you know, to subvert households. So these households can either mean, um, you know, the churches that are meeting in houses in, in, in Paul's time, they didn't have, uh, you know, uh, churches in terms of buildings or structures, but uh, there were many uh, house churches. So here households means, you know, the house churches, uh, and also it could mean families because families consist of these house churches. So either way, you know, if fam is a family is, uh, uh, is uh, impacted or affected by these false teaching, or if the head of the family is impacted by these false teaching, then he is going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, get his wife and his children also into this false teaching. And if this family is going to be uh, affected, then it's going to affect other families and it's ultimately going to affect the entire house churches that are uh, meeting. And he says that these uh, false teachers, they're not doing these uh, false, or they're not sharing these false teachings uh, because, you know, they are so uh, zealous for the truth or that they are holding on to or they're so passionate about what they believe in or what they think is the truth or um, holding on to these uh, things because they're so convinced that this is the truth. But their main motive of these false teachers is to make money. And we, we, we looked at this even in, uh, you know, Second Timothy, when Paul writes to Second Timothy. So the main agenda for these false teachers is basically to uh, make money. And they did not basically care in what they believed in. They didn't even know if it was the truth or if it was the right doctrines. They were not fully convinced or passionate or zealous that they are, you know, holding on to this truth and this truth has to be taught to others. Uh, but it was basically that, you know, uh, as far as they made money, they got money, they just kept, uh, uh, you know, uh, spreading these false teach teachings among the people. Now, verse 11 uh, points us to the nature of uh, their seductive activity of the false teachers and uh, why Paul is saying that they must be totally silenced or their mouths must must be stopped because in verse 11 we see uh, the motive. Their motive of these false teachers is dishonest gain. And what is their method? 
uh, their method uh, is they teach what ought not to be taught, that is false doctrines. And what is the multiple result of it? It is misleading the whole uh, family. So, you know, verse 11 basically points us to the nature of the uh, seductive activity of these false uh, teachers. And in verse 12, uh, you know, Paul points out another reason why you know he uh, that uh, Titus must appoint uh, uh, elders or uh, you know leaders in the church is because what one of their own prophets or the poet uh, who was considered as a poet a prophet a religious reformer uh, uh, who was uh, living in Crete during the sixth or the fifth century BC uh, he says that all Cretans are uh, liars uh, evil beasts and uh, lazy uh, gluttons and uh, you know, he's pointing out that not just because there are false teachers that you have to appoint, you know, leaders who are qualified, who can uh, address these uh, false teachers or can stop them, but also it is so important because of the, you know, uh, the bad character that these Cretans has or, or, or uh, you know, how they are recognized as. And so it's important uh, to appoint uh, leaders with good uh, qualities having all of those qualifications so that you know they can uh, lead the church at uh, Crete and then in verse 13 he says you know uh, this testimony is true therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith so uh, he says rebuke them uh, sharply now this word rebuke uh, is you know uh, is something that points out to convict uh, you know help uh, those who are guilty, uh, you know, teach them, convince them, give them the proof from God's word so they are convicted and, you know, they're hopefully, they're convinced of uh, the false teaching that they are teaching and hopefully they're convinced of the truth. And uh, so he says, you know, you need to do this very, very sharply because knowing the characteristics of these false teachers and knowing also the kind of people these Cretans are by nature uh, and hence it is very important to rebuke them uh, very very uh, sharply so the word uh, sharply in the Greek means severely or rigorously uh, so you know uh, uh, a sharp rebuke would just get their attention and uh, you know if not it's going to uh, ex escalate the problem and it's not going to help in any uh, way so he says you know rebuke them sharply so this them can refer uh, to the false teachers and also to the believers in the uh, in the in the house churches who have kind of listened to these false teachings and have uh, received it and are part of it so you know uh, he's saying even them include them in rebuking them sharply uh, so that you know uh, they become sound in the faith and they are no longer open or interested in these false teachers and their uh, uh, teachings. And so he says, you know, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound uh, in the faith. Uh, so they may be sound means they may be whole, they may be healthy uh, in the faith. So the goal of rebuking uh, these false teachers and the goal of rebuking the others in the church the saints and believers who have kind of uh, listened to these false teachers, received their teaching, is basically to rebuke them, to restore them uh, uh, to wholeness and to wholeness in the faith and to healthy uh, faith that they can hold on uh, to. So that is the main um, uh, reason why he's telling them to be uh, to rebuke them so that they are not uh, sick in their belief system but they're restored to the truth and that would help them to be healthy uh, in their uh, faith okay and then in verse 15 he says you know uh, to the pure all things are pure but to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure but even their mind and conscience are uh, defiled so he says to the pure all things so this all things you know applies to all kinds of food uh, that you know uh, is that uh, the some of the Jews uh, uh, these Jewish believers uh, 
uh, who are now spreading all of these false teachings, uh, you know, Jewish fables and this severe legalistic ascetic rules of eating the right kind of food, eating it in a particular way and all of that. So he says all things, which means, uh, you know, applies to food as well, applies to all kind of food. So he says all kind of food is created by God for consumption, uh, which we studied in First Timothy chapter 5, verse 5. And so he's saying, you know, uh, these false teachers were teaching these, uh, you know, uh, Jewish food laws, and they said it's still applied for uh, Christian believers who are part of the church. And so, you know, uh, Paul says, uh, it's not what you, uh, what goes in that makes you clean, but for those who are already clean in their hearts, those who are internally pure, all things are uh, pure. So this statement does not mean that, you know, uh, uh, does not include uh, sinful things because sin is not pure. But here he's basically meaning, uh, uh, talking about food. So he says you can eat any and every kind of food because everything is created by God. And it's not what goes in that makes you clean or pure, but it's, you know, having a clean and a pure heart uh, that is more uh, uh, important. And he says that, you know, um, for the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled, uh, you know, the, the word defiled in Greek means when a person either rejects the truth uh, of salvation by grace, uh, you know, as an unbeliever or because of other po forces or other outside pressures. So here the pressure can, or the outside forces can be those who are uh, Judaizers or these Jewish Christians who become the Jews who become Christians for bringing in all of these legalistic ascetic rules, you know, and he says, uh, you know, who are doing this to uh, add to their work of a sanctification or they're doing this uh, and saying that, you know, you have to follow all of these laws so that you can maintain your uh, salvation. So they're not just looking at salvation by grace, uh, you know, and through faith, but they're saying, yes, it is by grace through faith, but also you have to maintain your salvation. You have to add works for your sanctification, for you to be sanctified. You have to add works. And one of this is, you know, circumcision and the others is all of the other legalistic, ascetic rules that they were, uh, you know, spreading among uh, the believers in, in the church and uh, the house churches. So he's saying that when you add to a salvation that is by grace through faith and you add all of these legalistic rules then uh, Paul is saying you know uh, your mind your thinking process also becomes defiled and uh, polluted and when your thinking or your thought process is defiled and polluted because you're trying to do get achieve or maintain your salvation or uh, uh, you know being sanctified by works then it's naturally going to impact your conscience as well. And, uh, you know, the conscience which influences your faith and your actions also becomes defiled as, uh, as well. So he's saying that, you know, it's important to, uh, you know, not add anything to salvation by grace or not add works for your sanctification. Uh, but just receive it uh, by grace through faith uh, and, you know, um, not add on to anything apart from that. If you do it, it's going to basically defile or pollute your basic mind, your thought process, and also impacts your conscience, which influences your faith and your uh, actions. And um, thus we see in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 15, you know, uh, Paul is demonstrating to us that the true purity lies not in just observing external rules, but in the inner purity of the heart. And that has to be cleansed, that has to be regenerated. And how can it be cleansed and regenerated? When uh, it's only when we put our uh, faith and our trust in the finished work of the cross and, uh, you know, the complete provision that we receive because of what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross for our uh, salvation. And uh, it is this that, you know, leads us to moral 
moral rightness or this is what leads us to be righteous and justified in God's sight and also gives us the capacity because our minds are sound, our thinking process is sound, it's not defiled, it's not polluted. It's only then we can discern what is truly good and evil. So what Paul is telling Timothy Titus is, hey Titus, these people are not able to discern uh, truth from, uh, from wrong, from error, uh, good from evil, uh, because you know they are not fully trusting or putting their faith in the complete finished work of the cross but they're trying to achieve salvation by works they're trying to achieve sanctification um, by works so this is something that we too can learn you know it's not uh, our works that is important not we're not I'm not saying that you know we don't uh, bother about our actions and the way we live uh, you know when we are fully trust trusting on putting our faith in what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross, what he has purchased for us. We are mindful of that, you know, and that becomes our thought process. That becomes our uh, what is there in our minds and our minds are not polluted by other things. Then it just automatically translates into our actions and in our, our faith in God. So, you know, we are constantly, um, judging ourselves looking at ourselves uh you know and saying hey you know uh jesus died for me on the cross for this sin this sin is rendered inoperative uh you know it's nullified i'm dead to sin so the sin cannot overrule overpower me have any kind of dominion over my life and hence i'm going to you know uh you know uh the power of the holy spirit is available and i can overcome this sin but if we think that you know uh, we need to do works uh, works become very important for our salvation then we will continue to live in sin thinking that hey you know i have not been able to uh, uh i can't overpower the sin this is something that genetically is part of me is coming down from generations anger or uh, strife or outbursts of uh, anger you know which that leads in being uh, physically very abusive um, and i can't overcome this because you know i've seen this in my parents i've seen this in my grandparents and it's coming down from the generations i can't do anything about it but if you're looking at uh, you know your focus is and then what you're doing is you know okay i did this sin so i'm going to do something to cover it up so you know maybe feed the poor or you know uh give into some orphanage so try to uh you know or go and take holy communion thinking that the sin can be atoned and covered for uh you're trying to do it by works but if you're somebody who's looking at the finished work of the cross <clears throat> sorry if you're somebody who's looking at the finished work of the cross and what Jesus has done for us and the provision that he has made for us on the cross, then you will think differently. Your whole thought process is different. Hey, you know, Christ has nullified this, uh, has uh, am dead to this sin. This sin has no longer control over my life. The Holy Spirit is going to empower me uh, because the same power, the same dunamis power that has resurrected Jesus back from death to life and I identify with him spiritually in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his, his ascension and him being seated. I identify with him spiritually, what we studied in Romans chapter 6, you know, and hence, you know, I'm spiritually dead to the sin. The sin has no control over my life. And I'm seated at the right hand of God and I have dominion and power and authority over every force of evil that is trying to tempt me and overpower me to you know, indulge in this sin, uh, you know, I have the authority and I'm going to speak against this, use God's word. And then you're, you're trying to not, uh, you know, do it in your own flesh, but you're standing on the finished work of the cross, standing on the word of God, declaring it and using your spiritual authority and position that you're given and you're mindful of that. And that will translate into deeper faith in God and action uh, that can be seen in your lifestyle. And also you are totally dependent or abandoning yourself to what Christ has done on the cross, cross and the complete provision that you have received uh, for your, for, as part of your salvation 
the gifts that you have received, the spiritual blessings that you've received, you're walking in that and you're seeing that becoming a reality in your uh, life. So let's not, um, you know, depend on works, uh, but let's just, you know, depend on what Christ has done and make that a reality in our own uh, lives. Okay. So any questions so far? No yes, questions? Yes, Pastor. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, just to reconfirm. So you, you're saying that the verse that says that to the pure, all things are pure, and then to the um, pure... Um, is basically referring to food and nothing else, correct? Yeah, it's uh, not just, you know, uh, these all things is in this context talking about uh, food because they're bringing in uh, the legalistic uh, son of how, what kind of food to eat, uh, what, how to eat it. And also, yes, uh, you know, so he's saying what goes in is not what defiles a person. Uh, but in this context, he's uh, talking about that. But it can also apply in our context. It can apply about the, what not just what we eat, but what we watch, uh, you know, how we live our lives, who we are listening to, uh, whether we're following the pattern of the world or following the pattern of the things of the spirit or the things of God. Mm, okay. Well, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Anyone else has? Okay, if not, we'll move on to verse 16. Verse 16, as it was read, says, you know, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being admonable, uh, disobedient, disqualified uh, for every good work. So in verse 16, uh, Paul states a fact that nearly sums up uh, the matter. Uh, as it is related to the false teachers, he says that, you know, uh, they profess to know God, uh, which could simply mean that they know him as savior because these are not somebody who's come outside the, the churches. Uh, they are part of the churches. They're believers. These Jews who have become uh, be uh, believers, who have become Christians, uh, uh, they have um, received Christ as their Lord and savior. Uh, but it could also be, you know, a profession to know him in a deeper, in a, in, in a more intimate way through observing uh, rules and regulations which they seek to impose on um, others. So they're trying to bring in their whole uh, ritualistic baggage that they had uh, for the Jews in terms of keeping those strict laws and rules. Uh, which, of course, yes, God gave it to them, but his whole idea of giving it to them was not for it to become legalistic. It was not for them to become ritualistic, but it was a means where they would actually do it out of love for God, uh, out of a sense of reverence, a meaning, and, you know, in getting close in their relationship, in their fellowship with God. But this totally took about a different turn than what God uh, had brought in all this for them uh, uh, in terms of purity inward so that they can relate to this pure God who is holy. Uh, but, you know, they were trying to uh, uh, achieve salvation or maintain their salvation, so to say, uh, through not just uh, what they have received by grace or the finished work of the cross, but also through uh, rules and um, uh, regulations. And so he says, you know, uh, deny them uh, uh says but in works they deny him which means you know in in their works it's absolutely not going to you know get them anywhere because it never got them anywhere even as they kept those rituals and the laws in the old testament they just followed it because they had to it was no love for god it was uh, they did not worship him with all of their heart soul mind and strength so he says, no, their works deny him, which means their works means, the Greek word means to, it refuses uh, or disregards, disowns or rejects uh, their works. So their works does not have any standing. It does not have any uh, meaning because they have slipped from 
you know, uh, uh, their uh, uh, fellowship with God in terms of receiving what they should by grace and by love, they have slipped into works or legalism and, uh, you know, have gone away from uh, the way of grace uh, that God had uh, uh, designed for them. And also, you know, uh, uh, as a result, they have gone away with their relationship uh, with God himself or their fellowship with God himself. And so he uses very strong uh, words. He says they are admonable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work, which means admonable means, uh, you know, the Greek word means detestable. Uh, the, it just carries this idea of disgusting uh, because they've turned away from grace into legalism and hence it is detestable in God's sight. They're disobedient, which means they are failing to trust or rest in the person and the work of Jesus Christ as their uh, savior in what he has accomplished for them on the cross. And disqualified means that, you know, um, uh, the Greek means they have been rejected, uh, not standing the tests, and hence they are unqualified, worthless, and unfit for any good work, which means one of the purposes of uh, our life and why we have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, transformed from the kingdom of darkness in the, into the kingdom of light is so that we can be that royal priesthood, that holy nation, uh, people declaring, who are declaring uh, the praises of him who has brought us from darkness into his marvelous light, people who are kingdom builders, who are building God's kingdom, who are, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the in the, in the the whole work of fulfilling his purpose for our lives, uh, which is uh, usefulness in the ministry and serving Christ. You know, they cannot be useful. They cannot be qualified. They are worthless. They are unfit for any uh, good work because, you know, um, their sufficiency is not in, in what Christ has accomplished for them on the cross, but is this uh, based on works. And hence, they cannot do any good work. They cannot be, you know, uh, accomplish anything. And so he's saying, hence, you know, choose leaders who can, uh, you know, would not be disqualified, who are obedient, who are qualified for that position so that they can continue the good work uh, that God has started in their midst and encourage and strengthen and edify the churches at Crete. Okay, so that was chapter one. Uh, anyone has any questions? Chapter one. Any questions, any doubts? Okay, there are no questions and doubts, then we'll move on to chapter two. Okay, um, can uh, one of you please read chapter two, verses one to three, please? Chapter two, verses one to three, anyone can read? Shall I read now? Yeah, please, Sister Vani, thank you. Chapter two, verses one to three says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie. So here in verse 1, Paul is talking to Timothy, Titus here uh, in contrast to, you know, the false teachers who is just described. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, in contrast to the false teachers that he has just described in chapter 1, verses 10 to 16. Uh, so he's telling um, Titus that, you know, um, he is supposed to speak things that are sound in keeping with sound uh, doctrine. So he says, speak the things, these things that Paul is uh, referring to is what he has mentioned in verses 2 to 10, uh, which is regarding the truths, the attitudes, the actions uh, that are all uh, biblical, 
uh, uh, based, which are based on biblical truth. So he's saying, you know, speak um, these things. And he says, speak the things which are proper for sound uh, doctrine. Uh, I've just put various translations here. The Living Bible says, speak up for the right living that goes along with true Christianity. Uh, the New Living Translation says, promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching. And the Passion Translation says, your duty is to teach them to embrace a lifestyle that is consistent with sound doctrine. So uh, the idea behind this phrase, with, which are proper for sound doctrine, has to do with right living and not just right thinking. Now, sound doctrine in uh, in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, which we already looked at, focuses on the teaching of sound doctrine and how to refute the false teachings or the errors that are there. Whereas the sound doctrine that uh, Paul is writing here in chapter 2, verse 1, is more on a practical application of sound doctrine. That I said that the idea behind this phrase is uh, has to do with right living and not just right thinking. So wherever we see sound doctrine, it does not mean just teaching it, like he writes in uh, in Titus chapter one verse nine, where he says, "Teach the sound doctrine so that you can refute the false teachings or the errors that is here." But here in uh, that that is there, sorry. But here in chapter two verse one, he's saying. You know, it's a more practical application. It's about uh, living right in accordance with the sound doctrine or the truth that is in God's uh, word. So Paul always, uh, you know, he ties up sound doctrine uh, with practical Christian living that flows out of it. So it is not just a uh, sound doctrine has to do with teaching sound doctrine or teaching the truth uh, of the doctrines in God's word so people are sound uh, in their understanding of the truth of the doctrines in God's word but also he ties it along with you know that the sound doctrine has to translate into practical uh, uh, Christian um, living so if you have a doctrine uh, and uh, and it does not you know, it's not showing in your, uh, in, in your, the way that you're living in your lifestyle, then it basically shows whether you are uh, following the right doctrine or you're following the truths in God's word, because you're following the truths in God's word, the doctrines in God's word, it will translate into right uh, living. Otherwise, it is just, uh, you know, uh, uh, having a doctrine without practice or without the right kind of living or the right kind of lifestyle is a dead uh, belief. And in verse 2, he says, he, uh, uh, following, in verses 2 following, he's, he talks about older men, then he goes on to talk about older women, and he talks about younger men, younger women, and also he goes on in this chapter to talk about um, bond servants, or he talks about uh, slaves. So first he talks about older men he says that older men must be sober reverent temperate sound in faith in love and in uh, patience so he says you know teach them uh, these sound doctrines so this the older men will have all of these qualities which means that it does not come automatically with age all of these things to be sober reverent temperate sound and faith in love and patience does not come automatically you know you have to teach it to these people so that you know those who are older and they do not have these qualities that should describe them then they would need to focus on them rather than going on as uh, they are so the first thing he says these qualities of these older men should be that they should be sober which means that they must be vigilant they must be watchful over themselves, over their conduct, their conversation, the way that they are living their lives so that they are not setting a wrong example to the younger folks, the younger people in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the church or the community of uh, saints or believers. And then he says they need to be reverent, which means that they need to be honorable in their behavior, in their speech, in the way they dress. They need to be temperate, which means um, 
You know, here the word literally means not to be intoxicated by wine or strong drink. So temperate here is not talking about your temper, uh, emotion temper, but it's talking about this word literally means that not to be in intoxicated by wine or strong drink, uh, but it also has a meaning uh, to be, you know, sober minded and clear headed. Uh, in how you're living your uh, life. And then he says, sound in faith. Sound means healthy, whole in your faith. Uh, so the older men have to be healthy in their faith in God. And um, uh, and this comes, uh, you know, the life that they have lived of trusting God in, in every aspect of their life, in every area of their life uh, over the last so many years of their life. And uh, they should be sound in their minds in the doctrine of the faith. Uh, and they should not be led away by all of these false teachings um, so that, you know, they are able to be an example to the younger uh, folks. And he also says that their faith in Christ should be right and uh, genuine so that it can, um, you know, uh, it can help impact the younger folks. Then he says in love. Uh, you know, even as older people, uh, you know, people who are old and they, they grow into old age, they become very grouchy and, you know, hard to live with. And uh, so he says, you know, um, you should be loving uh, rather than being intolerant and being hardened towards others. You should be more gracious and uh, compassionate. And then he says, you know, they should be patient, which means the Greek word here means to be steadfast an active endurance, uh, not passive, uh, waiting on others, you know, but older men uh, are usually not uh, patient uh, with others around them. Um, and also, you know, uh, they just sit around doing nothing, just waiting uh, to, you know, uh, to go into the next life that is eternal life or whatever, next world, so to say. And, uh, you know, but he says you need to be actively, uh, you know, enduring the challenges that you're facing in life, the challenges of the old age. And you should continue running your race with a perseverance and endurance fixing your eyes on uh, Jesus Christ as we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So he says, you know, when older men have these kind of qualities, they stand out in the world, they stand out in the church, and, uh, you know, they are ultimately able to point out the beauty of Christ, and the other younger people are able to follow that, uh, and that becomes a kind of love, a, a lifestyle and a pattern that they set for the believers in the uh, churches. And then he says, the older women likewise need to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So just like the older men, older women also, you know, who are who no longer have uh, a child rearing responsibilities, basically around 68 years uh, of age, 60 plus. You know, what are these qualities that these older women should possess? They should be reverent in their uh, behavior. Uh, the Greek word uh, here translated reverent is used only here in the Bible. So, of course, reverent is used elsewhere in the Bible, but the Greek word for reverent that is used here is only used here uh, in the Bible. And it conveys an idea of being priest-like, which means acting as a representative of God. So uh, the word Paul uses here is basically, you know, describes uh, the whole thing of being devout and a having a godly character so these older women should be devout and have a godly character and they are to live uh, like holy priests uh, serving uh, in the in the churches serving in the presence of god and their sacred personal devotion to the lord will have an influence on every aspect of their lives and also will influence the younger folks and uh, so he says, you know, reverent in their behavior, which basically points to their inner characteristics. And of course, when your inner characteristics are reverential, it translates in the way that we, in our actions, that can be seen outwardly. And he says they should not be slanderers. Very interesting. 
Here the word slanderous here is diabolos. The Greek word for slanderous is diabolos. And diabolos, as you know, is one of the Greek words that is used as a name for Satan. And the word diabolos is used as a name for Satan 34 times in the New Testament. So this gives us a whole background of this word slanderer. So, you know, we know that Satan is a slanderer. He slanders the saints. He's a false accuser. Uh, and each time he, you know, he leads us as believers to slander, to gossip about others. It is basically we are doing the devil's work. And it's, it is so eye-opening to this whole fact. We never thought of it, you know, when we're slandering somebody behind their backs or we're gossiping about somebody. It is actually we are doing the work of Satan because the word slander is diabolos, which is one of the names of Satan. And uh, so he says when older women or anyone is slandering or indulging in gossip, they're doing the devil's work. And so he says that older godly women uh, should never surrender their tongues to the devil. So I hope this is an eye opener to all of us, you know, uh, to be very careful that, you know, uh, when we slander people, when we are um, gossiping about others, it's basically we are doing the work of Satan because the word slanderer, the word slanderer means diabolos, which is one of the names of uh, Satan. So if any of us have been indulging in that, you know, we can just come, repent and ask God to forgive us and break that spirit and uh, ask the Holy Spirit to take control of this area of our uh, life. Okay, we'll stop here. I'll I'll meet you at, um, at 11.01. I've taken one minute extra, so I'll give you one more minute. Okay, thank you everyone. Enjoy your break.